for some time is putting it mildly. It is an extraordinary document that details uh, Donald Trump's lies, uh, all of the things that he did, uh, along with his co-conspirators who have not yet been indicted to overturn the election. There's incredible detail, great detail. So I just wanted to start with, with you, Bill. You know, this is one of those, those, those moments that we have been building toward for so long, and it's finally here. I heard Neil Katyal earlier this morning describe this, uh, just, I'm sorry, earlier this evening, say this is going to be the trial of the century. This is going to rank right up there uh, with Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the greatest threat to uh, the American constitutional order since, uh, since the Civil War. So g- give me your sense of history of what this indictment and this trial means. Well, the irony, Charlie, I think, is that uh, people commented on this. The indictment is a very I mean, straightforward, if I can put it that way, really takes the three or four key elements of Trump's plot, the attempted coup, the fake electors, the threats to Vice President Pence, the t- attempt to use the Justice Department to uh, intervene and, and, and overturn uh, the state's resolutions of, of, of the election results. Um, it doesn't, I mean, there's so many, so much more one could say about Donald Trump's behavior, you know, in that, in those two, two months before January 6th, there's nothing of the day of January 6th, 187 minutes of silence as the Capitol is being stormed. And I think very much to Jack Smith's credit, he, I, and I defer to the lawyers, I guess Boat is a lawyer, maybe not Frank's a lawyer, Dennis is actually a real lawyer, um, on this, but I, it feels to me like Jack Smith really wanted to get the case that he could prove the most easily without the most comp without excessive complications quickly. get it to trial quickly trump's the only defendant he's got the co-conspirators who i take it are kind of teed up to be potential defendants but the, i'm told by my lawyer friends that the, you know the more defendants you have it just exponentially complicates the trial and delays things and so forth so i i think smith really did a my sense is a very focused job and certainly when you read through it i mean it's just incontrovertible final point i would make is um, and I say this with some prejudice because uh, our, our friend Tom Jocelyn, who used to work at the Weekly Standard, we worked so hard on the January 6th committee, and Liz Cheney is a, a friend, and she was so terrific on that. This does follow the January, this vindicates right. the January 6th yeah. committee, and I think really vindicates that whole effort, which one forgets was under huge assault. Uh, Nancy Pelosi went to quite a lot of trouble to set it up, but took some grief from her own people by putting Liz Cheney on it and making her so prominent. The Republicans ended up just uh, voting against it and opposing it and denigrating it. And Liz Cheney lost her congressional seat because of it. And and uh, and it's kind of out of things, you might say, in the Republican Party almost. But this, but that really laid the groundwork when justice, when the Justice Department, maybe for understandable reasons, was delaying. One forgets Jack Smith was only appointed when Trump. Uh, announced his presidential candidacy right in mid-November of 2022 when Justice Department was, I'm sure they were investigating, but they weren't visibly doing that much. The January 6th committee really laid the groundwork for this. And so yeah. it's in that respect, it's a, they didn't try to collaborate to do branches of government, but it's kind of a vindication of the political system to some degree. We'll see what happens in the trial and in the election. To some degree, a vindication of the political system as a whole. You know, for all the dysfunction, they were able to have a congressional committee that did its job for all the difficulties of the executive branch, they seem to have done a very good job here and in, in a serious rule of law uh, indictment of the former president. Yeah, and I mean, to go back to the, the, the four counts, you have uh, count one, conspiracy to defraud the United States, count two, conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, count three, obstruction of an attempt to obstruct an official proceeding, count four, conspiracy against rights. This strikes me, Mona Charon, as very, very broad. He did not charge Donald Trump with actually inciting the violence, but I thought it was interesting that the argument is that he exploited the the violence. He exploited the attack on the Capitol and in great detail walks through what Donald Trump did minute by minute during the day, including in the evening when he and his co-conspirators, obviously Rudy Giuliani and company, began making calls uh, to, to, uh, to, to senators and congressmen, urging them to to stop and slow down the, uh, the, 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 the count. So your, your initial reaction to, to Jack Smith dropping this indictment today. So it's funny you should mention that because um, that was one of the things that on the day of January 6th, when so many of the aspects of Trump's behavior, even though we knew what a psychopath he was, nevertheless, were still shocking. 
the fact that in the midst of this raging mob uh, going through rampaging through the Capitol, he tweets things that are intended to put his vice president in in actual physical danger. Uh, you know, and and in addition to that, and this is what showed up in the indictment, is that while it was going on, he was sending messages to senators to try to exploit yep. the moment to get them to delay the certification even then. And I'm so glad that that wound up as a count against him in a in a legal document. Uh, by the way, can we all just pause for a minute and see and just take a deep breath about how great it is to see Trump referred to as the defendant? The defendant. Um, <laughs> I mean, we've waited a long time for this. I mean, I know he's been indicted several other times, but this is this is the big one. Um, and um, I, I do think I w want to hear from Dennis, who knows yeah. far more about this. But uh, but I do think it's an interesting choice that he's he has indicted Trump alone. The others are co-conspirators, but they are not indicted, which means he can call them as witnesses. Now, of course, they can still plead the fifth. But if you have a, you know, a parade of people coming through and all pleading the fifth, that doesn't look so good for the defendant yeah. either. So I don't know. I'd be curious to see what uh, what Dennis thinks about that decision by the prosecutor. Well, I, I want to underline what uh, Bill, uh, I want to underline Bill's point about the January 6th committee. I mean, I do think that uh, you know, but for the January 6th committee, we might not be sitting here, you know, at this moment um, with this, you know, extraordinary indictment of a former president the first time in American history that a former president has been indicted by the federal government for attempting to overturn an election. And, you know, what, what really struck me about this indictment was not just the breadth, but was the clarity of the language that Jack Smith used as he went through explaining in great detail what, what Donald Trump did, all of his lies, his consciousness of his lies. And, and I know that there are, some, there are some people in the legal profession that have some qualms about the speaking indictment because they, they, they tell a lot of details that might not be pertinent to the actual indictable offenses. But given the historic nature of these charges, I, I think it was the right choice to make to explain to the American people what is at stake, what Donald Trump's conduct was, and why, and 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 you know, and what it meant. Um, I think in the larger context, uh, we're joined by Dennis Aftergood, who is a former federal prosecutor, U.S. attorney, has argued cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, a uh, contributor to the Bulwark. Dennis, you have been writing uh, extraordinarily detailed pieces about this. You looked through the 45 page indictment. Your initial reaction was this what you expected and what kind of a grade would you give Jack Smith? Um, first of all, let me just say what an honor it is to be here with three heroes of democracy for me. No, seriously, seriously. You were in at the beginning as Republicans who were not going to abide by the destruction of our democracy. And I can't begin to tell you my admiration for each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let, let me just step out of my lane for one second and maybe into Bill's a bit and just say, it really is worth stopping and just thinking what an historic moment this is. Exactly. This is, I mean, I, this is, I mean, in our lifetimes, for a former president to be indicted for trying to overturn the Constitution, mm -hmm. um, to undo the entire fabric of our democracy, this is, um, well, Nixon resigning you know, that was an outcome. This is not an outcome. This is a s major step toward an outcome. But Nixon was never indicted. This is the indictment of a former president for trying to overturn the election and the laws that he is constitutionally charged with executing faithfully. Uh, so... Um, 
Well, talk now, to me about the four the four counts, the conspiracy counts, because these seem to me to be. I mean, I know there were some people that wanted him to be charged with seditious conspiracy, which you know requires you know there are many many defenses to that. And but this strikes me as a very aggressive indictment, very broad that he went broad. He's brought in everything from the violence on January sixth, the discussion of violence the lying about uh, the, uh, the election, the attempts to um, influence the state governments, uh, the false elector scheme. I mean, he cast a very wide net with this, didn't he? He did. Um, this indictment is at once sure-footed. Um, I think it's prudently aggressive, but it is efficiently designed you ask me what grade bill what what's what's the one above a plus um it's this an a without part, grade inflation right we can say that <laughs> right 1970s yeah. <laughs> or, or 60s when i went to college um well yeah this, this will sound this the first part of this is going to sound arrogant so wait for the second mm -hmm. part but this indictment is done exactly the way I would have done it. That's the arrogant part. If only I had thought of it. Uh, um, well, no, no, tell me, tell me, tell me about that. You know, if only well, you had thought of it. So, what, what, what was, what was, what surprised you about this? You went, yes, that's what I thought that he should have done. Right, because he has charged these three conspiracies and. Be sure I come back to the substantive count, um, uh, the uh, obstruction of Congress count, which is both a conspiracy and substantively charged. But these are three overlapping conspiracies. All that proof that you see laid out in such elegant detail in this indictment, every piece of which you can be 100% sure he has the evidence to prove or he wouldn't have included it. All of that detail feeds each of these three charges. And um, the, the three charges, each is um, invaluable in itself, conspiracy to defraud the United States. That is to deprive the United States through deceit of its lawful functioning, which the Constitution's 12th Amendment and the uh, Electoral Count Act prescribe how presidential transitions are to occur. That's a lawful function. The second one, uh, conspiracy to obstruct the uh, congressional process. Yes, and you talked about exploiting mm -hmm. the violence. And he did that because he can prove that Trump exploited it. It is a longer shot to prove what I suspect you suspect is true, that he orchestrated it. But that would be a bridge too far when the burden of proof is proved beyond a reasonable doubt. In then there's the third one. Uh, which is the conspiracy to deprive civil rights, which is essentially depriving voters, the majority of voters who voted for President Joe Biden of their vote by doing this whole thing. And let me just add quickly, the last, the substantive count obstructing Congress is very important. Again, it's an overlap. And the overlap is important because he can do the trial with great efficiency, all the same evidence going to all four charges. But the last was important because that is a 20 year charge. The maximum penalty is, is um, imprisonment for 20 years. Conspiracies, five years. So one of the, the, the one of the challenges that Jack Smith is going to have to do is to show that Donald Trump knowingly lied, that he knew he lost the election and was spreading these falsehoods. And one of the things that struck me about this 45 page indictment is the detail that he goes through all the people that told Donald Trump 
um, that he had lost the election. He spends a great deal of time on on that. So I, I guess the overall you know question is, Mona, you know we we've talked about this for it feels like several years now. It is. Is is this worth it? Is is I know you were skeptical about whether or not it would be worth it to to criminally charge Donald Trump. How are you feeling on the on this night, which Jack Smith has dropped these huge indictments on the former president? Um, well, I have come to believe since we had that discussion many moons ago that it was absolutely necessary to indict him because he was threatening to pull down the temple if he was indicted. And so once he did that, you had no choice, right? If you're going to vindicate the rule of law, you absolutely have to indict him. And so I'm incredibly pleased with this indictment. And I, you know, I almost feel like we should think of Jack Smith as nemesis, you know, who was the goddess of uh, divine retribution in, in Greek mythology. I mean, it really feels that big. But but there are a couple of things, um, it, you know, following on to Dennis's point about the, that Smith has the goods. He has all of the evidence to back up what he says in this indictment. And there were some things that, as we read through it, were interesting surprises. One is... Um, Mike Pence was taking contemporaneous notes. Yes. And, and he's turned and, them over. And he has turned them over. And one of the things that Trump said to Pence when he was urging him to falsely assert the authority uh, that and illegitimately assert the authority to send back the electoral count votes and Pence kept resisting, Trump says to him, you're too honest. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, when someone says you're too honest, do you think he doesn't know he's lying? Um, you know, so so that was a, a very interesting reveal here. Um, and um, and uh, there was uh, there was another one. Oh, I'm going to uh, maybe I, I've forgotten what it is right now. But um, but uh, there there was more than one surprise um that well we'll, that... we'll come back to that okay. i mean and and, okay. and and i mean mike pence clearly did cooperate which is which is very interesting and also his comments tonight i don't know if anybody has them um because i was just listening to it a little bit earlier his 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 comment um to uh, he, he you know unlike ron DeSantis, who apparently is attacking the jurors now in washington dc mike yes. pence said you know this should remind everybody um that anyone who puts themselves above the constitution should never be president of the united states again and I thought that that was a very interesting point that that felt like a new uh, position by Mike Pence, who's associating himself with. With all of this, um, I guess Jonathan, I guess the Jonathan, question. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry go on. Yes. Can I ask Mona a question. Sure. Hey, Mona. Yes. Why was Mike Pence taking contemporaneous notes? Hmm. <laughs> Well, hmm. so it will be interesting to find out whether he just was taking notes throughout the entire vice presidency with an eye toward a book. Uh, but my suspicion is that he was protecting himself and that he he just like um, uh, uh, James Comey, he, he had a, a, a sense that this might come in handy. What do you think? Which is another way of saying whether or not it happened throughout his term or only by the end, he didn't trust the guy any further than he could throw him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and, and, and he, had, he had, you know, grounds to do all of that. You know, Bill, the other thing that struck me about all of this is the, and, and I, I don't mean any disrespect to lawyers, but, you know, lawyers are not, not universally known for their free of their writing. And um, Jack Smith has written a very, very clear narrative. And clearly, you know, he he has multiple audiences. I mean, obviously this is, you know, directed, it's a formal in indictment, but he, he did take the pains to explain the context. I, I thought it was very interesting. Like on, on the second page of this indictment, he says the defendant, Donald Trump, had a right like every American to speak publicly about and even to claim falsely that there had been outcome determinative fraud during the election and that he had won. He was also entitled to formally challenge the results of the election 
through lawful and appropriate means, such as by seeking recounts or audits of the popular vote in states or filing lawsuits challenging ballots and procedures. And then he goes on. But his efforts to change the outcome in any state through recounts um, were uniformly unsuccessful. So what he does is he makes the distinction, look, it is legitimate to question the outcome. But Donald Trump went so much further. And then he just lays out the conspiracy that Donald Trump Donald J. Trump did knowingly combine, conspire, confederate, confederate, and agree with co-conspirators known and unknown to the grand jury to defraud the United States by using dishonesty, fraud, and deceit to impair, obstruct, and defeat the lawful federal government function by which the results of the presidential election are collected, counted, and certified by the federal, uh, federal government. Purpose of the conspiracy was to overturn the legitimate results of the 2020 presidential election by using knowingly false claims of election fraud to obstruct the federal government function by those uh, b um, by which those results are collected, counted, and certified. Look, um, he is laying out um, that this, this indictment will be an indictment of the entire lie, that it's not just Donald Trump. It is, it is obviously focused on Donald Trump, but he's going to put the full weight of the federal government and the Department of Justice behind saying, the, this was a fair and free election, and that all of these stories were lies, deceit, deception, and that Donald Trump knew it. I mean, I think that that is that that, that I think is going to have political significance as well as just what's going to happen in the in the federal court. What do you think, Bill? I mean, I hope so. I, I think it it could, and I think it's it, he knew that they were lies, and they were lies in furtherance of an illegal set of actions that's the key i think doesn't he say somewhere in the yeah. I mean, you can lie basically you can say it's the greatest economy ever you can say that yeah. i you know i don't uh, you can deny saying things you said before you can say you think the election was stolen you can say you have evidence that the election was stolen if it's even if you don't right but if the lie is in the service of of a criminal act as part of a criminal act really um then it it is part of the crime, part of the conspiracy. And so I think he's just pretty careful to, it's not just that Trump's a congenital liar, exaggerator, et cetera. It's that it really was a conspiracy to overturn uh, a lawful election and to do so in unlawful ways. And I mean, it's, it's smart of Smith, I think, to make clear that you can challenge election returns legally. You can question them right. publicly, but this was this was different. I also think polit on the politics of it, but this is also on the legal side, It's so striking, Pence is only the most famous of them. I mean, how many of the people who are still close to Trump, we're now talking January 4th, 5th, 6th. I mean, we're talking after an awful lot of water was under the bridge, an awful lot of other people have left, who told Trump uh, and had in the preceding weeks and two months, there's nothing to this and you can't do this. And you and it's, and it's wrong to try to do this. And his own White House counsel and deputy counsel, and his vice president and other very senior people around him said this. And he had, and Trump just kept digging down to sort of lower ranks of the Justice yeah. Department and lunatics, uh, you know, crackpots on the outside and Rudy Giuliani types to find people who would tell him what he wanted to hear. And I think that's also you know, there. I think the politics could be interesting. At some point, you'd think Republican primary voters would look up and say, "Geez, Mike Pence," and they won't know the names, but the White House counsel and deputy counsel who would serve Trump for for several years and it defended a lot of stuff that. I suspect a lot of us think was pretty indefensible along that line. And Bill Barr had to resign because he couldn't put up with it. And he had told Trump there was nothing to this. An awful lot of Trump loyalists, who, as I say, had gone pretty far out on a limb, I would say, in defending Trump and maybe doing so inappropriately at times, uh, couldn't couldn't do this. And so it's not just a bunch of liberals. It's not just a bunch of Democrats in Congress, career people who dislike Donald Trump. This is his own counsel, deputy counsel, saying, this is crazy. His own vice president taking notes at a meeting advised by the vice president's yeah. counsel and the vice president's chief of staff to do so, I suspect, both of whom are, I know them slightly, uh, are very conservative, Trump loyalists. Uh, Mark Short had actually worked directly for Trump as well as for Pence and then the West Wing. So, uh, he became, he was Pence's chief of staff at the end. So I think the degree to which a, you know, Republicans with who were at all, at all committed to the Constitution and to the rule of law couldn't abide this. This was not just a bunch of, you know, liberals or or career bureaucrats. Yeah, and the but, indictment yeah. says that again and again. It says, again. you know, that th this was 
his attorney general. This was his advisor. This was his campaign chief. These were all people that he had hired, that he had trust, that he had given positions of trust um, who were telling him this. And, uh, you know, and then in addition, there were all the state leaders and so on. Um, officials, uh, the, the secretary, you know, loyal uh, Republicans in Arizona and other states who voted for Trump twice and wanted him to be the victor, he says in the indictment, but who could not uh, could not lie uh, as he was asking them to do. Charlie, two. No, quick, I, I think. Yeah, I'm sorry. Two quick points on your question. Um, a little bit out of my lane again, but um, although Trump has defied a lot of political gravity. Political boats can only take on so much water. This is indictment number three. There's another one almost certainly coming in Georgia. And my second point is what makes this one different? Everybody saw January 6th. So this is not Mar-a-Lago, you know, uh, but they saw it 30 months ago and there's still a majority of Republican voters are still supporting him for another term. Yeah, that's that's the defiance of gravity. And so uh, I, I'm just saying that there's all kinds of possibilities here for accumulation of effect, especially when you see it with your own eyes, as opposed to documents unlawfully retained in Mar-a-Lago. OK, very so serious. Okay, so that, that leads to two questions. Number one, will we see a trial before the election? And if there is a trial, what are the chances that it will be televised? So who are you asking? Anybody who has any insight oh. into that. Okay, so one thing, uh, you know, the federal trials are not televised. Right, um, but they can be. They well, it would require the a change in the rules. Oh, you're uh, a waiver. Yeah. Which a waiver, right? Which could happen. Uh, but uh, but we'll have to see about that. Unlikely. Um, sorry? It would be unlikely, yeah. Yeah, well, it's unlikely. Um, but, uh, but the fact that there is only one defendant does mean that the chances of it getting, you know, getting down to business are much better because you don't have to coordinate, you know, six different lawyers and all their time and, and the needs of all these different defendants and whatever. So that actually makes it much more likely, in my judgment, that this case will go to trial before the election, unlike mm. the Mar-a-Lago case where there are all those classified documents and there are other things that are going to really slow things down. Plus, the judge in this case is very speedy and uh, she, she is a no-nonsense kind of judge. So I think those things combined mean this actually could come to trial and be, you know, determined be, be, we would know the outcome before the election. So Dennis, do you, do you agree? Do you think that there will be a trial? Because my understanding is that in DC, um, you know, the time from indictment to, uh, to the disposition of a trial averages about a year and a half, which would certainly put it past the election. So what do you think in this case? Well, I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say, this might not be an average case. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this um, might be an outlier. Uh, we know that Jack Smith <clears throat> wants his cases tried before the election. We know that because he set the Mar-a-Lago case for December 11th, which was just this side of plausible, but too ambitious. But it told us he wants his cases tried. He may not get them both, I think for reasons that Mona said, this one is the key, plus, it's the more important case for all the reasons we've already said. And um, here's something I've been thinking about. What's Jack Smith's next move? How's he gonna get that done? The 2024 Trump trial calendar is getting awfully crowded. But there is a window it's a narrow window in late February. There is a Trump civil trial scheduled for January 29th. The judge has said that's not moving. It's a, 
at least a five-year-old class yeah. action case mm -hmm. for defrauding investors in a pyramid scheme, okay. Trump. They've estimated that trial would be two to four weeks, but that was before the uh, plaintiff's lawyer, Robbie Kaplan, dropped Trump family members as mm -hmm. co-defendants. Two to three weeks before, uh, I'm sorry, two to four, now they've dropped. So let's say three weeks. The fourth week in February is four weeks and change before the trial that's scheduled for uh, uh, Alvin Bragg's New York indictment. You got a four week window there. I believe that Jack Smith is gonna move to use that date and it creates an interesting dilemma for Trump. Uh, this, this is time consuming. I mean, these things are time consuming to be a defendant in this many cases. I mean, this is one of the things that I don't think you should underestimate. You know, it's you're running for president of the United States at the same time you are facing these multiple cases. Now, obviously, Trump's strategy will be right to to delay as much as possible and to you know try to convince judges. I'm just too busy. I'm doing this really important thing. I can't stand trial. Um, my guess is that you know most of those judges are going to be very skeptical. Of Even the, Eileen the, Cannon the, wouldn't go for that. Yeah. <laughs> if Eileen Cannon doesn't go for exactly. that, then I think that's an <laughs> indication. Okay, so Bill, I don't want to just brush past this this larger point of you know that all of the people cited in this. And by the way, just on I think page two of the indictment, it goes through all of the people from within his own administration who told him that he lost. Um, and, you know, the reasons to believe that when he was lying, he knew that he was he was lying. But um, and, and Dennis's point is that this is different because we all saw January 6th, but we've all been living through this. And let's just the chase, because this is a bulwark centric topic here. Republican voters have been willing to swallow so much over the last seven years. Every single time he's been indicted, his poll numbers go up. There's been incredible success uh, in, in, by Trump world in normalizing what happened on January 6th. Um, this indictment comes down the day, uh, the day after we get that New York Times survey showing him with a prohibitive lead in the Republican primary and tied with Joe Biden 43-43. Is there any reason to believe that this will, in fact, move public opinion in any subs in any meaningful way? Not necessarily a large way, but any meaningful way at this at this point. Considering what we know about the Republican electorate, the Republican field, what do you think, Bill? I mean, I'm doubtful that it will move many Republicans uh, and change the primary, the outcome of the primary. Um, you know, for obvious reasons, given what we've been through. Yeah. And I would say just with Dennis's point, I think he slightly overstates. I mean, we don't, we haven't seen, it's still a 45 page written document at this point and a very brief press statement by Jack Smith. Uh, it's not like Mike, now, if we get to a trial and Mike Pence describes the meetings on January 4th, 5th, morning of the 6th, maybe, I can't remember. Yeah. With, well, that's one thing. But I don't know, we don't, even on your timetable, we don't get to that till after the first couple of primaries and maybe not even till after Super Tuesday, right? So, and I don't know, are they really going to make Trump come sit in a trial when he's, you know, in the middle of the presidential campaign? I know the Justice Department rules are 60 days from the election day usually, but they could, I don't know, I'm I'm pretty more, I'm a little, I think Smith wants to move fast. I think Bragg will cede to him if he has to and say, I'll put off my trial in New York. I think he can do a lot of things to try to make it happen fast, but I'm a little pessimistic about that. I think absent the actual testimony, it's still written documents, if you want to put it this way. And they can be distorted by Trump world and Fox world and so forth. Um, so I'm a little pessimistic about it changing much with the caveat that we're in totally uncharted waters. So who knows? And, you know, it's the third indictment. There'll be a fourth the straw that breaks the camel's back. I think we discussed this on a previous live stream. Maybe do, do the straws ever really break the camel's back? You know, I feel like they, yeah. I feel like I how, camels how many camels have been killed by straws? Yeah. carry a lot of straw, you know, and I, they don't ever seem to really just collapse in the desert. So I, I'm pretty pessimistic about that. You, know, you got to think in a general election, though, for some swing voters who don't like Biden much and have gripes about this and that with the left, that, that this becomes kind of a moment of, uh, but I just can't vote for him again. So I think it, it does reinforce January 6th, you wouldn't have thought on January 7th, 2021, this January 6th, no. a lot of reinforcement. 
But here we are. So I think Mona, you and I talked about this on our, our podcast just between us. And and you know, Mona called me out when I said, I don't think it's going to make a big difference. And as you point out, Mona, it doesn't have to make a huge difference. It only has to move a segment of the electorate. Exactly. Exactly. It just has to make a marginal difference because you know, our elections are so, so close. And if a fixed number of Republicans, so one of the things we saw in that New York Times survey that was so interesting today is that a solid 25% of the yeah. Republican electorate is, is openly anti-Trump and will not support him. And they even it's go a non-trivial so number. No, no. It's, a, it's a huge mm-hmm. number. 25% are anti-Trump in the primary, but yeah. at least 29 yes, to and 25% that's right. say and they'll vote for Biden. So That's right. That's right. So mm-hmm. and what I was about to say is, yes, 25% are anti-Trump. That's right. And and a percentage of that of that 25%, yeah. I think it was 16%. What was it? 16% of the 25%, I think, would not vote for him in the general either. Um, so it was something like that. But in any event, it's a non-trivial number. And it could change. A poll is just a snapshot, et cetera, et cetera. Um, But I do think that um, we saw in 2022 the power of the uh, anti-crazy vote coming out. Um, We've seen it in a lot of local elections, plus the Dobbs decision motivated people as well. But um, but it really doesn't, you know, the Republican Party has become crazed and cult-like to a very marked degree, but it doesn't take very many. And there will be a constant drumbeat of evidence starting now that will filter through. Trials are amazing attention getters. And the fight, you know, the this side says this and this side says that is intrinsically interesting. Trials of the century have always been a feature of our history. Mm-hmm. They rivet the public. There are going to be people who until now have had a basically benign view of Trump or have thought the press makes too much of his, you know, wrongdoing. And I, well, I thought he did OK as president. The economy was good who are going to be for the first time confronted with some of these facts. And it's going to break through for some. Yeah. And that's and, enough. And, you know, and, and, and the pictures, you know, did that the point that this is different because we all saw it. And I said something snarky like, yes, we saw it at the time that was 30 months ago. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about it more. Um, one of the things we're going to see is not just these these facts. We're, we're going to see the images again. We're going to see that video. And I was noting that our friends from the Republican Accountability Project had a, have, a, have an ad that just says Donald Trump needs to be held accountable. And it had the footage that we've seen before, but it's, it, it is powerful. It is powerful imagery watching these cops being attacked. And this is going to be part of the dialogue. And I have to say that one of the themes that ran through, and I mentioned this, I think, a little earlier in, in this indictment is, is how often violence comes up um, you know, during the discussions. Like, for example, I think I can find most of them. Um, on page 36 of the indictment, um, on January 5th, Donald Trump meets alone with the vice president. So you kind of know where this is coming from. <laughs> when the vice president refused to agree to Trump's request that he obstruct the certification, Trump grew frustrated. They call him the defendant here, but I'm, I'm editing. Uh, grew frustrated and told the vice president that he, Trump, would have to publicly criticize him, uh, criticize him. Upon learning of this, the vice president's chief of staff the position once held by our colleague Bill, was concerned for the vice president's safety and alerted the head of the vice president's secret service detail. He was prescient enough to understand the threat and the way that it might morph into violence, and we know what actually happened. Uh, A little bit later in, in, in the discussions, after they talk about the defendant's exploitation of the violence at the, at the, at the Capitol, you know, and, and, and it talks about um, the timeline of the tweets, uh, 2.24 uh, p.m. Uh, Mike Pence didn't have the courage. One minute later, the United States Secret Service was forced to evacuate the vice president uh, at the Capitol throughout the afternoon. You had, you know, traitor Pence. Um, one of the things that, that, that comes up in, in the discussion with some of the lawyers is people saying, you know, this may lead to, um, you know, th- this kind of a challenge to the election may lead to violence. 
um, and the discussion in the White House of whether or not that might be acceptable. And so, again, you know, I don't know that this is going to change anybody's mind. I mean, I, I, it feels naive at this point, Bill and Mona, to say that this is going to change any minds. But if it's only three or five percent of people who say this man lied, he conspired, he was trying to undermine and destroy the democracy, and he exploited and used violence against the Capitol and against police officers, you would think that that would that that would move at least some, even people who have been, you know, willing to go along with a lot. Or or am I being? I, I feel like there are other people from but the think, bulwark who, just, who would, would be saying, "Oh, you guys, yeah, of you're, course, you're smoking well, the hopium," you know. But, we probably are. I mean, I'm no, I'm yeah, I'm but, sort of basically yeah. pessimistic, but I would say I think how it would work. I was thinking about this as Dennis spoke. I don't think it's going to be that voters, you know. Who aren't paying close attention in Wisconsin or Michigan suddenly are going to read the report or watch something on TV and say, oh, my God, I, I thought before I could vote for him, I couldn't. I think there'd be a two step process. I think Republican elites, some elected officials, people who served with Trump, conceivably, as they digest this and then maybe as the trial begins or at least pre-trial motions and so forth. So there's stuff that keeps this going. I mean, does, what is, does Bill Barr, does Mike Pompeo, does Mike Pence move from their current position, which I would think which i think is kind of we don't want trump to be the nominee but we probably would have to vote republican of course in the general election because the worst thing in the world would be biden being re-elected to no we can't even vote for him in the general election i don't think bill barr says that i'm going to vote for biden but bill barr says we should just write in some way now i think if you again how many voters in wisconsin michigan are paying attention to pence bar all these characters not that many, but maybe one, two, three percent of the Republicans are paying attention to each of them and to Tim Scott. And if, if you got re a real number of Republican senators, governors, uh, kind of Wall Street Journal editorial page, is it conceivable that the Wall Street Journal editorial page, if it's a Trump, given this indictment, if it's a Trump Biden race, will say yeah, we're not for Biden, but we, we can't a good conscience support Trump. I think that would have an effect on keeping some happen. business types <laughs> from from supporting Trump. They probably won't say it, so it probably won't have that kind of effect. But, <laughs> but I think that's how it would work, is all I'm saying. I think that the, the, the mechanics of moving the three, five, eight, ten percent would be a kind of two-step thing through Republican and conservative elites to conservative voters. Uh, you know, uh, that's just my, that's my thought. So we, we have a lot of these co-conspirators named in, in all of this. I think that the consensus is the co-conspirator number one is Rudy Giuliani. Well, um, I'm, I'm not sure who, who's co-conspirator number two. Is that, Eastman. Is that Eastman? That, Eastman? That's that's John Eastman. Do we know who the senior advisor is? I've been is, asking. Is that Steve I Bannon? Or I, Navarro. Yeah. I think Peter Navarro. Okay. So, oh. okay, so, so here, here's an interesting. Think based this, on some things that have been printed. I, I find this really interesting on page 35 of the indictment. This is January 4th, when co-conspirator to, this would be Eastman, acknowledged to the defendant's senior advisor that no court would support his proposal. The senior advisor told um, Eastman, you're going to cause riots in the streets. Co-conspirator to then, according to the indictment, responded that there had been previously points in the nation's history where violence was necessary to protect the Republic. After that conversation, the senior advisor notified the defendant, Trump, the co-conspirator too, had conceded that his plan would not work. So they're already talking about the possibility of, you know, of, of, of violence. Again, the next, uh, the next uh, paragraph. On the morning of January 5th, at Trump's direction, the vice president's chief of staff and the vice president's counsel met again with John Eastman. Eastman now at I'm they call him co-conspirator to it now advocated that the vice president do what Trump had said he preferred the day before, which was unilaterally reject electors from the targeted states. During this meeting, co-conspirator to privately acknowledged that he hoped to prevent judicial review of his proposal because he understood it would be unanimously rejected by the Supreme Court. Great lawyering by the vice president's counsel expressed a co-conspirator to that following through with his proposal, the one that Eastman was proposing and that Trump wanted, this would result in a disastrous situation where the election might have to be decided in the streets. That same day, Trump encouraged supporters to travel to Washington on January 6th, 
and he set the false expectation that the vice president had the authority to and might use his role at the certification proceeding to reverse the election outcome. I think that's extraordinary because it basically says they knew the possibility of violence. Now, again, he's not charged with incitement. So, Dennis, I mean, I think we've gone over this, but um, to charge Trump with uh, actually uh, criminally inciting violence would raise certain First Amendment questions, right? I mean, Jack Smith made the decision that that might be too tough to prove. So he went with the exploitation of the violence rather than the inciting violence. Just talk to me about that. Why, why the, the way he structured this, uh, this, this conspiracy indictment. A smart prosecutor figures out the difference between what he can do, what he might do, <laughs> and what and and what he must do or should do. And I think he discarded Smith discarded the things he didn't actually need to do. He didn't need to take on the legal issue, the First Amendment issues around whether the incitement was protected or not protected speech. Um, I, I I also I just can't help lawyers point moment of appreciation. Here's Charlie Sykes on the political website reading from an indictment. Oh my gosh. Now, here we have a beautifully scripted, as you said at the beginning, Charlie, yeah. speaking indictment. And Charlie is speaking it. <laughs> well, um, and by the way, we, we, we ought to mention um, that uh, at, at the Bulwark, we have actually, we are also going to be publishing, you can, um, audio version of this trans, of, of this uh, indictment. In fact, it's already done. Uh, it is the miracle of automated voice generation. We've done it with previous indictments. So look for that. It's out on YouTube and we're going to make it part of the Bulwark podcast as well. And I will tell you, when you listen to it being read, you really have an appreciation of the fact that Jack Smith is telling a story. And it, it's, it's a story that goes into great detail to explain the significance of each one of these. And, and I guess I was struck by the amount of granular detail that he was able to put into 45 pages, that he was able to tell this narrative in a very concise way, that, that even though it deals with very broadly with the fake elector scheme, the lies, the attempt to influence the legislature, you know, talks about what happened in Pennsylvania and Arizona and Wisconsin. This indictment is still very much focused. Uh, you know, it comes to a head on January 6th, the events around January 6th. So in fact, it's very tightly written. And, and again, I, that's where I, I really kind of admire this because this could have been a sprawling, detailed, nerdy document of hundreds of pages, or it could have, you know, they could have gone down various rabbit holes of a lot of the co-conspirators, but they didn't. This is the story of Donald Trump clinging to power, conspiring to hold on to power, lying um, to, to hold on to power. And it's impossible to read this without understanding all of that, that, you know, who this man is, and, and what is at stake. So let's talk about what is at stake, Dennis. I mean, I, I always hesitate to, to, to go along with the, the hypiest interpretation, but when I heard Neil talking about this as you know, one of the most important trials of our time, my reaction was not that this was hype. This really is the trial that will kind of determine whether or not our legal system can protect a constitutional democracy. I mean, just talk to, I mean, again, sometimes these, you know, a criminal case is narrowly focused on, on the facts and, and the defendant. This one has so much, the implications are so much broader, aren't they? Yes. And uh, picking up on what you had said just a moment ago, Charlie, like a good politician, a good trial lawyer is a storyteller. And I don't know if it'll be Jack Smith, but he, you can be sure that he will have his best storyteller out front talking to the jury. I, I have um, two thoughts in different directions about your question. 
Um, one is you're exactly right. It's not, this is not just the trial of the century, it's the trial of the two and a uh, third centuries, 235 years since the constitution was ratified. Um, and at the same time, we always have to be careful about not placing too much weight on the criminal justice system. Accountability is central to the rule of law and to a society bound by it. This is a very, very important piece, an important play within the larger drama. But the larger drama is the drama of the American people and what they make of it and what they make of what uh, of everything that is happening. What I admire so much about the story that he's told is that while there are some new details, most of what's in that indictment, one time or another, has been already in the public record. It's the weaving of it together. Exactly, yes. That's what you said, in a mm -hmm. single coherent negative. And I think that as Mona said, as even before the trial, but if the trial happens before the election, that story will keep coming out. I don't think it will be televised like the January 6th mm -hmm. uh, committee hearings, and television is powerful, but I do think that the stories and the televised version of the stories that come out um, will have very much the same effect as those hearings had on us last summer, the hearings that Bill rightly pointed out were the key here. One last point, I know I'm talking too much, no. but you have to step back and admire talking about seamless webs, how the parts of our system that are working have worked together. Let's face it, Merrick Garland, my law school classmate, very good person, dropped the ball. Didn't take this up fast enough, chose to go after no. the big numbers. But in the vacuum that he created, just as Bill said, stepped Nancy Pelosi with those hearings. And together, delayed for sure, but we have this moment of historic accountability. I mean, just to tip Dennis's point about the um, <clears throat> not putting too much weight on the criminal justice system, let us hope it comes through and saves us, so to speak, from ourselves. The Senate could have convicted, of course, speaking of dropping the ball, right? The failure, when you really think back, I think when historians look at this, the failure of the Senate to convict at yeah. a trial to really go through a lot of this, some of that was discoverable even in February, right? And then to convict Trump, uh, that was the appropriate, the most appropriate, immediate constitutional uh, solution to the problem might still have been a criminal trial. There probably should have been criminal trials later. You could have both, but you can't have exactly both. But you can have trials of others, certainly, and so forth. <laughs> Excuse me. But um, so that was another case where now the good news is maybe we recover from that mistake. But that it just when you think about the last two and a half years, I think that failure of the Republicans in the Senate, yeah. obviously the Republicans in the House too, but the Republicans in the Senate to uh, to go ahead and and convict Trump when they when he was already out of office, when they knew he was guilty, when they knew it would solve the problem of him running again in 2024, is really an astonishing act of political irresponsibility. Such a good point. Uh, that, really that is an important point. And I'm sorry, Mona, go ahead. Well, I was I was going to just agree and and note that uh, Mitch McConnell has done you know some good things in his career. But uh, unfortunately, his legacy is forever stained by his lack of leadership at that moment um, to to fail to uh, corral his colleagues and get the required. What was it? 16 votes. I think he would have needed yeah. uh, to convict. Um, he he could have done it. I've talked to people on the Hill. He could have done it if he had just exercised leadership. But uh, he's got to he regret that, too. He has to know that he, he was this close. Yeah. And, that, and, 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 and they could have they could have, you know, imposed the sanction that he could that Trump could never seek uh, office again. Uh, it was right there for the taking and they let it pass. And that was a terrible dereliction 
uh, that uh, I, I guess they now are, are ruining, uh, and in fact, we all are as a, as a country. Uh, but, um, but, you know, the, but Dennis is right, Bill's right, you're all right, that uh, it really does, it is a test for us, the American people, uh, and, and it's not clear that we will pass it. Um, See, I think that's, I think that is the heart of it. This is the ultimate stress test. And, you know, we, you know, the, the sort of the, you know, hundred pound gorilla in the room is, is the reality that if Donald Trump uh, wins the White House again, gets back in, all of this goes away. He oh, would absolutely. pardon himself. He would pardon his co-conspirators. He would wipe out, um, you know, any charges against him. If the trials are not complete by that time, he would just simply order the Department of Justice, which would be, um, to say that that is a constitutional crisis is putting it mildly. One other point, though, and I think, you know, look, we have been doing this for a very long time. And then this is really addressed to, to Mona and, and Bill, because we've been talking about Donald Trump and all of these issues. Boy, how long has it been, Bill? I feel like since 2015 now, you know, it's longer than the duration of World War II. And it does feel as if everything that we have done and fought about leads to tonight that you know we have been warning people about donald trump's character about the threats he posed and we've been brushed off by a lot of our fellow republicans um we are the ones who have been pushed into exile but go back to the original moment when there were those of us who said we're not going along with donald trump because donald trump is 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 off the scale of acceptability and and here we are tonight and this is what i mean at, at some point you know dennis was saying this is going to be arrogant well this is going to be the ultimate kind of we told you so we have spent more than half a decade saying this is going to lead to a constitutional political moral disaster for the country and here we are with the former president facing federal criminal indictments for his role in a coup, an attack on the truth and on democracy. And you know, this, you know, it, it does feel like a culmination of every warning that Mo and Bill Crystal and I and all of our colleagues have been going over and over and over again, sometimes feeling like we are shouting into the void. Do you feel that way, Bill? Yeah, and just to make it slightly more elaborate on the point, it's like one of these. Uh, it's like a good movie or a novel. We thought we were out of the woods, so to speak, on yes. November fourth, twenty twenty. You know, a little, a little closer than we wanted, but Biden had clearly won the election. Then January six happened, which was horrible. But again, we survived it, as it were, and it was very clear that we had been utterly correct in our judgment of Trump. And so there was that 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 moment that happens halfway through the the movie or the Netflix series or whatever where you think, oh, okay, we've sort of resolved this, and then to have it come back in the last two and a half years and Trump, you know, four thirty five points ahead for the Republican nomination, and even with Biden and the entire Republican Party, not as but more subservient and more willing to indulge in lies than it was even two years ago, let alone five, let alone eight or ten. I mean, so this is the second chance, as it were, right? This is Act Four, or Act Five, after the fake out of resolution in Act Two or Three, yeah. which didn't quite work out. I don't know the theater that well, so but yeah. I think something like that. And so it is. I think the dry. Yes, it's, this really is the moment now. The next uh, eighteen months or so. Charlie, well, uh, yes. Go ahead, Dennis. To to pick up um, Mona's point about leadership and your point about because this, this comes back to what I, where I started, you guys are the heroes of democracy, that leadership depends on what your focus is. It depends on doing the hard thing. Your focus has always been preserving, maintaining a constitutional republic. McConnell's focus, unfortunately, was uh, trying to restore his leadership position, uh, his, his formal position of leadership. And to do that, he abdicated his real position of leadership. Bill, help me with this, because I'm trying to think of, a, of that Churchill quote where 
choose honor, you you, you end up with with neither. You you get you, you know, had that, a choice between war and dishonor. You have chosen dishonor. You will get war later. Exactly. <laughs> thank you, Mona Sharon. Hey, and thank everybody for listening to uh, the bowl, this uh, special Bulwark live stream. Uh, live stream. Um, and tomorrow morning, Bulwark. Obviously, we will have a lot more about this. Uh, we'll have our podcast as well that will deal uh, with, with, with this. Uh, keep your eye open for the live reading of the indictment. And uh, we'll continue to cover this. My Thursday podcast is devoted to the Trump trials in partnership with the folks from uh, Lawfare. And we will take a deep dive into this indictment and what happens next. So to my colleague Mona and Bill and Dennis, thank you so much. And to all of you, we are intensely grateful that you time with us and that you have become members of the Bulwark Plus community. Thank you all.